Now, now. 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 What does that word, now, really mean? You might say that it describes the gap between the future and the past. And yet those Minkowski diagrams imply that the now is infinitely short. If it is, then time must be continuous. But what if time were discontinuous? What if there were particles of time, like the grains of sand in this hourglass, each of which couldn't be split up any further? If that were the case, then each particle would represent the smallest moment possible. A uh, now, in other words. Some theoretical physicists think that's the way time is. Dr. David Finkelstein. The main thing to remember is that while time may be very hard to talk about, it's not itself a hard thing, like a piece of flint, like this. Time is the relation between things that happen. If you like, time is just one damn thing after another. As soon as we learned that electricity came in bits and energy came in bits, we began wondering whether time did too and space. And these bits were called chronons. These bits too aren't material objects. They've got to be events, happenings, the things of which time is made, like the sun going down. The question of whether they exist is a question of whether the things that go on in the world are a steady stream that can be cut anywhere we like, or whether, in a sense, God too has an hourglass with grains of sand in it that fall one by one. I don't think most people realize how far physics is from a theory of the world. I think people trust physicists too much. There has never been a theory of the world. Newton didn't have one. He had at best a doctrine. Find the forces was his doctrine, and you'll understand everything. Today we have a doctrine of elementary particles. The characteristic time for elementary particles is around 10 to the minus 23 seconds. This is roughly the time it takes light to cross a particle at rest. If the chronon were that big, then it would be important for the structure of elementary particles, matter, and the rest of the universe. I'm hoping that that's about where the answer is and that the bewildering variety of particles we've been discovering recently is just a reflection of the different ways in which elementary processes weave together. The other possibility, an extreme one, is to ask how small a division of time can be made before the energy required to make that division get so large that it in turn creates a black hole that swallows up the event. That time is around 10 to the minus 42 seconds. The very question of the continuity of nature has been with us as long as people have worried about time at all. Heraclitus said that time is as a child playing checkers. Zeno, five centuries before Christ, raised the following paradox. Let's get my old friend the flint back again. Zeno considered the following experiment. We drop it, it hits the ground, and he proved that couldn't happen. Because in order to reach the ground, first it has to fall halfway. Then it has to fall half the remaining distance. Then half the remaining distance. Then half the remaining distance. If you can always cut the distance that remains in half, it seemed to him it took an infinite number of acts before it could reach the ground. How can you carry out an infinite number of acts in a finite time? Therefore, it never reaches the ground. 
It's an infinite sequence that never terminates. We are all immobile, according to this argument of Zeno. Before we can move any distance, we must move half that distance, and so on. Lord Russell, back about the beginning of the century, used the movies to convince himself that just because life looks continuous, there's no reason to suppose that it actually is. Because the movies, too, are one frame after another, and yet give this illusion of continuity. The main question is, if there are chronons, if there are frames in the world motion picture, how many frames per second is the show going on at? This continuity in the world motion picture show, the fact that we do see time as just one thing after another, has given rise to a concept known as the arrow of time. It refers to something so basic we're hardly aware of it, and yet as sure as one day follows the next, if it changed, life would be unlivable. What is this strangely powerful concept? Quite simply, it is the fact that one day does always follow the next, that time does always flow in a single direction, from the future to the present and into the past. Time's arrow, in other words, always seems to point the same way. And perhaps it's just as well. After all, a clock whose hands occasionally went forwards and occasionally went backwards might be worth something as a curiosity, but as a means of telling the time? We live in a world of endless one-way changes, and we become aware of time by observing these changes. Changes in the position of the hands on our clocks, changes in nature, and changes in our consciousness of events. It seems obvious to say that our awareness of time is not an every now and then sort of experience that sometimes runs forwards and sometimes runs backwards. And yet if the interactions and collisions of atomic particles were our only guide, it would be very difficult to say which way time was going. Imagine that these billiard balls are atomic particles. Now, some of these sequences have been reversed. Can you tell which? When balls pop up out of the pockets, of course, it's obvious. But by and large, each collision looks right. In other words, it behaves according to our expectations, whichever way you run the film, forwards or backwards. But as we've already seen, our large-scale world isn't symmetrical in time. Once we start to look at larger and larger groups of particles, the arrow of time becomes more and more apparent. Although it's possible that all these balls could arrive at the same place, at the same time, with just enough energy to cancel out each other's motion, sending the white cue ball up the table to be stopped by the cue, it is rather unlikely. It's this unlikeliness that gives time its arrow. Let's look at what's happening in this beaker. Here, instead of a few particles, there are literally billions. The molecules in the crystals of our sugar arrow are jiggling about in a fairly ordered way, while the molecules of water are moving around in a random fashion much more quickly. For the moment, it's a fairly clear-cut and organized arrangement, but one of the universal laws of nature predicts that this cannot last. There is an overwhelming tendency in physical systems for orderliness and organization to break down into disorderliness and chaos. The measure of this increasing chaos is called entropy. And inevitably, as the entropy in the system increases, the outcome of this experiment will be a beaker full of reddish, sugary water. So the universal arrow of time always points towards the future. Because each moment is in a greater state of disorder, in a mathematical sense, than the moment before. 
it is, after all, a more precise way of saying that, given time, everything decays. So, we observe the universe to be expanding, entropy to be increasing, and time marching endlessly into what we call the future. Uh, yes. Mm. Why? <clears throat> well, if everything was reversed in our universe, uh, we wouldn't really notice the difference, would we? I mean, if everything obeyed the rules and everything went in the opposite direction, I mean, if all waterfalls flowed upwards and if all planes flew backwards and if all food... and if all food went the other way. Uh, yes, yes, quite, of course, yes, you're absolutely right. So long as everything obeyed the rules, we'd never know the difference. After all, a time-reversed human being would have a time-reversed brain, capable of remembering the future and predicting the past. And despite the fact that to us everything would look distinctly strange, the time-reversed inhabitants of that world would find nothing particularly odd about their lives. There wouldn't even be anything strange about the contents of a beaker, like this, arranging themselves into clear water and a red sugar arrow. Uh, I don't quite see. Well, remember the arrow of time is really no more than a measure of probability. What's happening in this beaker is certainly improbable, but not impossible. If you waited long enough, the motion of the molecules in the beaker could reassemble our sugar arrow. But you'd have to wait a very long time. All right, well, in our universe, for instance, how long would it take for the chance movement of the molecules in this beaker to reassemble the sugar arrow, which is in here somewhere. Well, back at the turn of the century, a French mathematician called Henri Poincaré suggested that provided you sealed it off from the outside world, you could calculate what's called the recurrence time of any event. In this case, it would be about 10 to the power of the number of atoms in the beaker, which, let's say, is 10 to the 25. Oh. That's 10 to the 10 to the 25 seconds. That's right. <clears throat> oh. That's a very long time. Oh, yes. It could be quite a bit beyond the end of time. The end of time? Is there something you're not telling me? Pardon? Well, you mentioned the end of time. Um, I'm not sure I like the sound of that. I mean, if it's going to come soon, I'd quite like to make a note of it in my diary, you know. Uh, end of time, no appointments today. Don't worry. It's still a long way off. Oh, well, that's a relief. In fact, in cosmic terms, we've only just begun. Good. Right at the moment, our universe is about 15,000 million years old. And there's some debate about what it's eventually going to do. The outcome hinges on, of all things, an estimate of how many atoms there are in the universe. If there are enough to exceed what is called the critical density, then the gravitational attraction they have for each other will continue to slow the expansion down until about 50,000 million years from now it will stop, like a ball that's motionless at the top of its curve. Then the universe would begin to fall in on itself. Slowly at first, until 50,000 million years later, it would be exactly the size it is now, but contracting. After another 15,000 million years, it would return to those unimaginably hot, dense moments that were occurring at its birth. Both space and time will then come to an end, and our universe will cease to exist. Some cosmologists have suggested, however, that such a cycle may continue, heralding the birth of another universe. This would mean that ours may simply be one of an infinite number of universes bouncing endlessly in and out. Nobody will ever know. Nothing, not even time, could survive those moments in between when the universe occupies no space but is infinitely heavy, infinitely hot and infinitely small. Right, so the end of time may be 100,000 million years in the future. Uh, does anybody know whether... There are enough atoms in the universe for, for gravity to overtake expansion? No, not really. Although if current experimental evidence turns out to be true, there aren't enough atoms in the universe. 
there is on average only one atom of visible matter for every 100 liters or so of empty space. And that's only 1% or so of that critical density. Black holes and other strange astronomical creatures may alter this figure, but at the moment, it looks as if the universe has a rather empty future. In 5,000 million years, our own sun will have expanded to engulf the inner planets, including the Earth. It will then collapse, becoming an incredibly dense object, about the size of the Earth, called a white dwarf. Indeed, a piece of a white dwarf, the size of a sugar cube, would weigh over five tons. After another few million years, it will have cooled to no more than an icy lump moving silently through empty space. One by one, although new ones will be created from time to time out of the galactic dust, the stars in the heavens will begin to go out. Some will blow themselves apart as supernovae. Some will collapse into black holes. And many, like our sun, will simply dim and cool. As the expansion continues, the fading galaxies will gradually disperse and become invisible. And even the few giant black holes that are left may eventually disappear through a process akin to evaporation. There may be occasional flurries of activity as neutron stars or black holes collide, lighting up the darkness in remote corners of the universe. But basically, that will be that. All that will be left of the universe will be black empty space, with nothing left to happen, no events left to occur, the concept of time will cease to have any meaning. We will have arrived at the end of time. Good night. Right, thank you, studio. Uh, hang on a moment, will you? Uh, just waiting for the... Yes. Yes, OK, I will do. Uh, we're just waiting for the... Yeah, OK, good. Right, thank you, studio. That's the clear. Thank you very much. Bit of a bleak end to it all, isn't it? No, no, I thought you were fine. No. <laughs> no, time, the universe. Oh. Yes. Yeah, well, okay, I'll see you for a minute, OK? Sure. Uh, sorry, Dudley, you were saying? No, it's the end of time. It's a bit difficult to grasp. <laughs> Makes all this seem a bit, um... Pointless. Yeah. <laughs> well, uh, I must be getting on. Tempest, Fugit, and all that sort of thing. Yeah? Fugit, Walter. get on? Well, I'm still confused. But at least I know why I'm confused. That's because time is confusing. Seems to be much more than what clocks measure. 
seems to be an idea more than a thing, and yet we experience its passing all the time. <laughs> all the time. As, uh, as something very real. Oh, yes, very real. Mm. I, I think I've got an unaskable question for you. Prying into mysteries? Yeah, well, let me ask it anyway. Yes. What is time? <laughs> Yes. Well, I once asked myself that long ago. But I found that every answer I came up with, I discovered that I could disprove it. Mm. Mm. Oh, there was one exception. One answer I thought was accurate and honest. What was that? Uh, if I am not asked what time is, I know. But if I am asked to explain it, I know I don't know. At the third stroke, it will be 10, 41, and 10 seconds. On BBC One, tomorrow night, Spot...